Lord, it's good to come into your presence again this evening. It's good to have fellowship in our different groups, and it's good to have fellowship with you. And we do pray for your fresh cleansing for us this evening, a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit. And uh, we pray that your word would come alive for us. Please take my lips and use them for your glory. Take our ears and our hearts, our minds, and help them help us to be receptive, to hear what you would say, and uh, to draw closer to you, to learn to love you more, and uh, to be the people that you want us to be. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as you can see from the first slide, we've got a mustard tree, storm, and some pigs tonight. Uh, and in our last study, you may remember that we started looking at the parables that Jesus spoke. And uh, in the first part of this chapter, or uh, this part of uh, this, what we're looking at today, that continues. Um, and we saw last time that a, a correct understanding of the parables is so important. They've been much misused over the centuries by people imposing ideas and meanings on them and miss the true point of what Jesus was teaching. But um, I think before we move on, it's worth reminding ourselves of what Jesus said was the purpose of the parables. He taught these parables immediately after he had been formally rejected by the Jewish leaders. And in uh, Mark 4, 10 to 12, uh, we read this. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. This is the parable of the sower. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And Jesus was keen to explain to his disciples the mystery of the kingdom of God, and the mystery aspect being the period between his two comings. Um, and his messianic kingdom, that part of the kingdom, was clearly prophesied in the Old Testament, so it wasn't a mystery. It was something that was known uh, and was, was expected, uh, which is why they wanted to make him king during his time on earth. So we're starting today with the parable of the mustard seed. We have that in Mark 4, 30-32. And uh, it's... Uh, it reads as follows. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And uh, on the slide there, we have some mustard seeds. Um, <coughs> This parable has often been misunderstood, but I think it contains both encouragement and a warning. The encouragement is that the kingdom of God will grow large from small beginnings. Uh, in Jewish thinking, the small size of the mustard seed was proverbial, since it was the smallest of the seeds that were sown in the field. And apparently it took between 725 and 760 seeds to weigh one gram and 21 grams to weigh an ounce, so that's approximately 21,000 seeds per ounce. So they are pretty small. But within a few weeks in Israel, it could grow to some 12 to 15 feet tall, or if you think metric, that's four meters or so. And we see something of the rapid growth of the church on the day of Pentecost and the weeks after that. And the worldwide church has grown significantly over the centuries, with the growth, thankfully, continuing today. And the mustard seed is known for taking root in shallow or even rocky soil, yet it has the potential to move large stones as it grows. And I think actually that, set, that characteristic of the mustard plant could suggest that categories two and three in the parable of the sower we looked at last time, are indeed believers, because the, the soil there, as Jesus described it, was shallow and rocky. And obviously, I think we should be aware of the difference between the visible church, that which is seen by the world, 
and that encompasses the religious system that we might call Christendom and the invisible church, which comprises only true believers in Jesus Christ. And if we are consistent with what Jesus taught earlier that same day in the parable of the sower, the birds of the air were the agents of Satan who snatched away the good seed of the word. So I think it's more likely, rather than so often people think that it's the, it's, uh, the, the, the kingdom growing big, um, that the birds of the air can find shade. I think it's more likely that Jesus is once more referring to the birds of the air as a bad thing. Um, and we know that over the centuries, various groups, various cults have aligned themselves with Christianity while still teaching falsehood. And so some religious unbelievers have joined themselves to the organization of the church. And so, you know, these unbelievers have joined as, as a picture of birds of the air taking the shade uh, of, of, of the, the mustard uh, tree. Some commentators see the incorporation of the Gentiles into the church as a picture of the birds. Frankly, I'm not convinced by that. I think it's more likely that the birds of the air are, of the air are consistently a, a negative thing in the New Testament. And Mark adds a comment in verses 33 to 34 uh, and says, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. And we know from the other Gospels, and particularly Matthew, that Jesus taught with other parables. Uh, but with Mark, his, his rapid momentum means he moves on. And he summarises the style of, of Jesus' teaching after his, his rejection by the Jewish leaders as being in parables. But Jesus explained the meaning of them to his disciples, because in his love for true believers, he wants them to be well informed. And those with spiritual eyes to see are the ones who will understand God's word. And we need the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us as we study so that we do understand it. Well, Mark moves on and. Uh, next, he deals with Jesus calming the storm which we read about in verses 35 to 41. On the same day, when the evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? And we know that this occurred on the same day that Jesus was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Uh, that we learned from Matthew 13, 1. And the same day that Jesus had taught in parables. That was, we learned that from verse 35, we just looked at. Um, Jesus had taught the people so that they might grow in faith in God. And for the disciples, now that faith was going to be tested uh, as they were in this boat on the sea. Jesus had left the multitude of people. He wanted to cross over to the other side of Galilee. And we know that geographically the Sea of Galilee is surrounded on the east and the west sides by mountains and hills. On the west are the hills of Lower Galilee and on the east are the Golan Heights, originally known in the Bible as Bashan. And even today, winds can rush down both sides of the mountains and stir up a storm, often quite suddenly. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long at its longest, eight miles wide at its widest, and at this particular point, it's about five miles across. And all th three Gospels that mention this incident, which is Matthew, Mark and Luke, emphasise the severity of this storm that arose while Jesus and his disciples were in the boat. 
And Mark tells us in verse 37 that the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. And the waves must have been blowing over the side of the boat so that it was filling with water. And several of the disciples we know were experienced fishermen. They'd spent their lives on the lake, and yet they were clearly concerned for their lives. In verse 38, they told Jesus that they were perishing. In the meantime, Jesus was asleep in the boat. He knew there was nothing to fear. And at a human level, the disciples' response was to be expected. But we should note first that Jesus had expressed the intention to cross to the other side of the lake. And he, being the son of God, he was going to get there. They needed to learn to trust Jesus in all circumstances, as we all do. And ha But how would we have reacted if we'd been in the boat with him? Jesus hadn't promised an easy trip, but he did intend to arrive at his destination. And equally, he promises never to leave us or to forsake us, even when things get tough. Second, Jesus himself was with them in the boat. So his very presence with them should have given them reassurance. He is the very son of God who was involved in creating the universe, and that includes the Sea of Galilee and includes the winds and the rain. And the disciples needed to learn that Jesus can handle every situation. And that's another lesson that we all need to learn. And third, the disciples should have taken notice of the fact that Jesus was perfectly at peace in the midst of the storm. He wasn't worried for their safety or his. And as Christians, we know that we are fully secure in Christ. Yes, our life on earth might end suddenly, but as believers, we have a secure future for eternity with our Lord and Saviour. And that is one that is going to be far better than our life now. And in the middle of this storm, Jesus was asleep, taking a nap after a long day. I think that shows us something of his, of his humanity. He was tired. He'd done a lot that day. We should also remember it had been a difficult day. He had just been formally rejected by the Jewish leaders, despite the numerous signs that Jesus had worked to show himself to be the promised Messiah. Jesus would have known the trajectory that he had embarked upon in the light of that rejection and that it would end with his death. And yet, despite that, he could rest peacefully, knowing that all things were under his and his father's control. And being Lord of creation, he knew that he was secure, even in a tossed and flooding boat. And all too often, our lack of faith is what causes us to panic and to fear. But that's when our eyes move away from our security in God in all situations. God is big enough to deal with our greatest fears and our worries. And being God, of course, Jesus uh, and, and the God the Father, they are never asleep so that, that, that they are unaware of what we go through. Perhaps we should remember the words of Psalm 121 verses 3 and 4. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. This is not to ignore that as a man, Jesus was asleep in the boat. But as God, he was still holding the universe together. Only the divine son of God could do that and then still the storm as he did. And in verse 38, uh, the disciples even questioned Jesus' care for them. He, they said, Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? What a brazen statement or brazen question to ask the all-powerful, fully caring son of God if he cares. In fact, it's more of an accusation than a question. But how often do we doubt God's care for us when things seem to be going wrong? So many people accuse God of not caring when they go through difficult times. And we should remember that this was Jesus' first practical lesson for his disciples after his rejection as Messiah. And he knew that he had to teach them to trust him in all circumstances. Jesus' rejection would lead to his death. 
and he knew that he had to teach them to trust them. And actually, for most of the disciples, it would end up the same way. They needed to learn so that they could stand firm. And thankfully, we live in a part of the world where that fate of death for the sake of Christ is unlikely for us. But we still face opposition from those who do not love God. And he lovingly wants to train us to trust him in all things. I mean, it's, we know that things are getting harder, so opposition could well get worse. I think it's interesting that the word that Mark uses in verse 39 for be still, as Jesus rebuked the wind, it means to muzzle. It's actually much stronger than peace be still that we find in so many translations, including this one. It was sometimes used as a technical term for rebuking a demon. So it almost seems perhaps that the enemy had sent the storm as a demonic act to attack Jesus and his disciples. And if that was the case, then it was a spiritual battle between the power of God and the power of the enemy. And we could take great comfort from the fact that it only took a few words from Jesus to win that battle and calm the storm. More than that, not only did the wind stop, but there was immediately a great calm. Normally it takes hours after the wind drops for the sea to become calm. But here it was instantaneous, just at the word of Jesus. That takes a lot of power. But when you have all power, it's no big deal, is it? Someone has calculated that the power generated by the wind and waves on Galilee would have been around six times the total output of the UK national grid. That's quite a lot of power. Yet Jesus calmed them with a word. Such is the power and the care of our Saviour. And then Jesus challenged the disciples over their lack of faith in verse 40. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And the word that Jesus used for fear is a cowardly fear. They were timid and they had a lot to learn about the need to trust Jesus in all things. And yet their response in verse 41, when it says they feared exceedingly, um, is a different word for fear. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? There, the word for fear is the word from which we derive our word phobia. But its, fl its flavour in the Greek is more that of reverence and awe. And I, I suspect that if we had just seen Jesus still a violent storm, we would also be awestruck. It was a visible ma manifestation or demonstration of the power of God, and therefore a visible repudiation of the Pharisees' rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. And in the space of a couple of verses, we see Jesus' humanity and his deity shown very clearly. And then as we move into chapter five, there is a visible encounter between Jesus and a demon-possessed man. And uh, the account starts in verses one to five. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by them, by him, and the shackles broke in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. This incident occurred just as Jesus got out of the boat after stilling the storm. It must have been a very long day for him. Um, but it also provided a battle with demons just after Jesus had himself been accused of being empowered by the prince of demons. And this incident shows that Jesus is much stronger than Satan and not at all subservient to him or indeed working with Satan. The, the Jewish leaders got it so wrong. And we should bear in mind that the account that we have of this incident in the three Gospels where it's mentioned, that's Matthew, Mark and Luke, 
describes a man in the most extreme degree of being in a demonized state that we find described in scripture. Matthew says there were two men. It's not a contradiction. It's just that Mark and Luke only reported on the behavior of one of them. And the description of the man gives us information regarding the effects of demon possession. He lived among the tombs, a fact that would make him unclean to Jewish eyes. He had superhuman strength so that he couldn't be bound, even with chains. He cried out constantly and engaged in, in self-harm. And Luke also tells us that he was naked. And it's a reminder of what Satan can do to people. He is a thief and a destroyer who will destroy who he can, degrading his victims. And he is a serious and destructive enemy, and we should treat him as such, while still remembering that we as believers, uh, uh, we are in Christ, who has the victory. The account continues in verses 6 to 10. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Then he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. The demons here noted the deity of Jesus. Because uh, it says the man, or the demons within even, worship Jesus. And I think it shows us that it's possible to recognize the identity of Jesus, but still not accept him as Lord. These demons knew that their doom was one of torment. Uh, we get that in Matthew 8, 29. What have we to do with you, Jesus, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Or in, uh, that, so they knew that torment was coming. Or we could look at uh, Matthew 25, 41. Then uh, this is the uh, uh, Olivet Discourse uh, and the sheep and goats judgment. Then he, he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what the everlasting fire was prepared for. It wasn't really there for people. But of course, if we're going to side with the enemy, we share his fate. And back in um, the, uh, the, the Mark passage in verse 9, Jesus asked the name of the demon. That was a common Jewish form of exorcism. It's not that Jesus needed to ask that to, in order to, to achieve the deliverance that was needed. But the demons responded through the man, saying that their name was, Le their, their name was Legion, for there were many. And a Roman legion had 6,000 soldiers. So there were clearly many demons in the man. It may not mean that there were actually as many as 6,000 demons in the man, but there were certainly many and an impressive evil force. And perhaps surprisingly, the demons asked Jesus to send them out of the country, presumably as a hoped for alternative to him sending them to the abyss. And we get the solution in uh, verses uh, 11 to 13. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Pigs were an unclean animal to the Jews. But here we are in the area of the Decapolis, which was 10 cities, where there was a mainly Gentile population. So pigs wouldn't be forbidden in that region. Mark tells us there were 2,000 pigs. It was a sizable herd. And the demons knew that they would be subject to Jesus' command and presumably in an effort to, be, to avoid being consigned to the abyss, they asked Jesus to be allowed to go into the pigs. And Jesus gave his permission with the result that the demon-possessed pigs ran down into the sea and drowned. Literally, the text says that one after another, they drown themselves. The pigs may not have made any conscious choice in the matter, 
But it reminds us that each person must decide one after another whether to follow Christ or the devil. And the outcome for the pigs shows the destructive nature of the demons, reminding us that we must never play, we never play around with anything that's demonic. It also shows us that Jesus has full authority over the demonic realm. And it's likely that the demons would end up in the abyss, having gone into the sea in the pigs. And then Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark continues in verses 14 to 17. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. And then they, then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Those who fed the swine fled. I guess it must have been a terrifying situation to witness, as the power of God in Jesus was clearly seen to be so much greater than that of the demons. From God's perspective, it shows that the material loss to the owners of the pigs is of much less value than the soul of a man who needs release and salvation. And that ought to correct our perspectives as we live in a world that is so driven by materialism. And the greater response is that the men who had fled into the city told other people so that they in turn went out into the country to see what had happened. We don't know if they saw the corpses of the pigs floating along but we do know that they saw the man who had previously been demon-possessed, now clothed and in his right mind. We don't know where he got his clothes from. Maybe one or more of the disciples had to offer something to him to, by way of clothing. But there was no longer any threat from the man who had, been, who had before been so fierce and uncontrolled. God had moved in power, and yet the people asked Jesus to leave the region. They were more afraid of a free man than a possessed man. Maybe they feared further losses to their business interests. Maybe they preferred the status quo to the presence of God in the person of Jesus. And there's no biblical record that Jesus ever returned to that region. Not everybody who sees God at work will be pleased. How we need hearts that are open to God's good work in this world. And the section closes with this 18 to 20. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, uh, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. As Jesus went to leave, the newly delivered man asked to go with Jesus, showed, showing that he wanted to become one of Jesus' disciples. But Jesus declined their request, telling the man to return home and to tell his friends what great things the Lord had done for him. He had a more important ministry among his own people than by joining Jesus' disciples. That perhaps raises the question of why this man was told to spread the good news of Jesus and what he'd done, whilst on other occasions, Jesus told people not to tell others that they'd been healed. Various reasons have been offered, but I think the most likely is that this man was a Gentile, and Jesus was not encouraging Gentiles to join his group of disciples at this stage. He'd come for the lost sheep of Israel. Later in this chapter, in verse 43, Jesus told a healed person not to tell what had happened. And the same occurred in chapter 7, verse 36. And Jesus' rule of secrecy appears to have applied only in a Jewish setting. In the meantime, the man went into the towns of the Decapolis, verse 20, and spread the good news of his healing. And all the people marveled. It's no wonder that they marveled, because only the divine Son of God could have cared enough and had authority enough over the demons in the man to set him free. And we've seen in this, in what we've looked at today, we've seen some dramatic examples of Jesus' power. 
he is still the same Lord, the same Saviour. He is still changing lives that would otherwise be lost, all because of his deep love for humanity. And we should never underestimate the significance of a life changed by the gospel of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And whether we have a dramatic testimony or a simple one, God has still worked a mighty miracle to change us. And he continues to work in our lives today to make us more like Christ. Our role is to be obedient to him, to live for him, to be available for him to use as he knows is best for us. And in the process, may God have all the glory. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you so much for what we've looked at today. Thank you for the amazing power of God that we've seen uh, worked by Jesus. He stilled that storm. He calmed the sea with a word. He drove out all those demons with a word. He didn't have to make a fuss. He didn't have to flaunt his power. He just spoke. And Father, we thank you that that changed lives. And we thank you that as Christians, you have changed our lives. You have worked a mighty miracle in each one of our lives by just causing us to be born again, that we would turn away from our old life and enjoy living in the new. And Father, would you just so continue working in us that, that we would grow in our faith, we would grow in our, our walk with you and become more like Christ each day. And we ask it in his name. Amen.